Good morning again, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Richard Washington, and I am a program manager at the National Center for Victims of Crime. We want to thank everyone for joining us this morning for an incredible, incredible training, um, and we look forward to uh, spending the entire day with you guys. Uh, just a few housekeeping keeping items that I would like to know for anyone who is new to the Zoom platform. They're the chat box that can be used to send messages to the entire group, myself or our IT coordinator, if you are having any issues. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Please click on that box and type questions for the presenters there throughout the webinar. I will pose them at the, for the presenter at the end of our training during our Q&A session. Any questions that we don't have time to cover today, we will address them in a follow-up email within a few days following the webinar. We'll also be singing, sending around an email after the webinar with a PowerPoint, a webinar recording, a link to uh, the post, a link to the uh, evaluation survey, along as well as any resources or any handouts that we will use during the training. Before we start, I'd like to introduce Jessica Manka, and she is from the Assistant United States Attorney's Office, who will provide us with some opening remarks. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, my name is Jessica Minka. I work with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Western District of Washington. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, a little bit about my background. I worked at the King County Prosecutor's Office for a number of years before moving over to the United States Attorney's Office. Um, and I work uh, pretty extensively on issues of gun violence and gun violence prevention. Um, I wanted to say a thank you to the National Center for Victims of Crime, our host, um, and in particular to Richard Washington, who you just heard from, for his engagement. Um, this project began as we were looking at how to improve victim services in our region, um, and Richard has been instrumental in helping us um, tailor our presentation to the needs of our jurisdiction um, and hearing from us about how um, we can best get these messages out to our community. Uh, I want to say also thank you to Tracy Orcutt and Amy Bullard, who were involved in the creation of this training program, um, both of them at the King County Prosecutor's Office at the time. And finally, a thank you to Chief Andy McCurdy for his longstanding work on trauma-informed policing uh, that is the foundation for the module that you're here from today. Uh, before we go any further, um, we wanted to pause to honor Seattle Police Officer Lexi Harris, who was killed yesterday in service of the community, um, and to acknowledge that many of us are sitting with the grief and pain of that loss today. Um, in thinking about this terrible tragedy, uh, I have been struck by how emblematic it is of the trauma that is woven into the very nature of our jobs and how that affects um, how we show up in space um, and how we serve the community. So I wanted to take a step back um, and defer to Chief McCurdy, who knew Officer Harris um, well and, and can speak more to honor her memory. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, I just wanted to take a minute. Um, you know, Lexi Harris was somebody I had the fortune of meeting uh, many years ago when she first started in law enforcement. And I met her through an uh, after school weightlifting club that I manage in, in White Center at Evergreen High School. And Lexi and her friend Callie uh, were both new Seattle officers and they both have a background in um, sports performance coaching and fitness. And uh, they helped me get that program started by coming and interacting with the kids and providing some coaching. Um, and they're both as young officers were, you know, the epitome of community police officers. They've gone out of their way in only five years of really working to change the culture in policing and uh, working to create programs within Seattle Police Department to focus on officer and community health and wellness. And, I put a link to uh, Lexi's website in the chat. Uh, if you have an opportunity to, she had a number of podcasts posted on there. If you have a chance to, to look at some of those, um, I, I, I think you'll be um, impressed with uh, the work that she's done even in a short, short amount of time as an officer and uh, just her positive attitude and her outlook on life and uh, her ability to connect with other people was, um, uh, was impressive and I was fortunate to know her. I just found out about uh, an hour ago that uh, Lexi was the officer that had been killed and uh, it's pretty devastating. So now I have to talk for the next six or eight hours about trauma. So um, try to bear with us. And uh, if, if you guys wanna take a moment of silence or if anybody wants to put anything in chat, if they knew Lexi or have anything to say about it, um, you know, hopefully as a community, we can all come together and support each other and 
uh, just recognize that uh, you know it's these kind of uh, events that the public doesn't necessarily understand what we do and you know most officers are uh, that do lose their lives in the line of duty or get seriously injured it's related to things like traffic collisions and suicide and we think a lot about these other high profile events that uh, may have the community question their trust of us but it's these types of things where we put our lives on the line for others that uh, it's really what it's all about to be a police officer and um, it's just a very sad day so um, like I said if you want to click on the link and read more about Lexi and, and, and listen to her talk about her perspective of policing uh, I think it's uh, very um, appropriate not just for the training today but um, also for kind of where we are in our society right now in law enforcement. Jessica, I think uh, make a very awkward shift into the material we're here for today then. Thank you. Um, thanks, Andy. I wanted to talk just a little bit about the genesis of this training um, and why we believe it's so important. Um, I believe to my core that building trust and legitimacy with the communities we serve is our number one priority as public servants. Um, and I also believe that procedural justice is the foundation of both public safety um, and officer wellness and safety, and that we should be having the conversation in those terms. Um, so thank you all for being here today to engage um, fully on that conversation. One of the other um, bases of this training is that, again, I mentioned that a lot of my work is in gun violence prevention. Um, and in, with the rise of, of homicides and violent crime over the past year, um, there's been a lot of conversation about how we can address that rise um, in gun violence. And I have often been struck by the fact that we talk about um, trauma-informed policing in the context of domestic violence and sexual, sexual assault and human trafficking, um, of course, as we should. Um, but also believe that we should be having that conversation uh, in the context of responding to gun violence, um, because the experience of being shot um, is one of the most traumatic instances for any individual, um, but not only for that individual, but their brothers, sisters, parents, um, children, and then concentric circles of the community. Um, there was recently a study that communities that experience high rates of gun violence also have um, a disproportionate amount of negative health incomes. And so if we can think about um, trauma as we're serving the community and responding to gun violence, um, I believe we can do our job better, um, again, in, in serving communities and addressing violent crime. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Chief McCurdy, um, and thank you all for your time today. Thank you, and Cameron, I think I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now, if you can give me permission. And Jessica, do you mind to uh, let me know if you can see my PowerPoint now? We can see it, thank you. Great. Uh, so as Jessica said, my name is Andy McCurdy. I'm the chief of police for the city of Covington. Uh, today, I'm actually coming to you uh, not as the police chief of Covington. I'm coming to you as a, a trainer and instructor. I have a business called Sar Sarge Training. And the reason I started my consulting and training business is because I think there are certain gaps that need to be filled uh, that as a police chief, I can't necessarily fill through my official duties. And I want to have an opportunity to, to uh, interact with people in a, in a slightly different stage. So the training today is something called uh, Project Engage. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about what Project Engage is, but I, before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself just to kind of set the stage for uh, where I come from and, and why I'm presenting this class to you today. So um, I've been in law enforcement for about 29 years, but I actually come from a family of police officers. Uh, both my mother and father were police officers, and I have one sibling who also is a police officer, shockingly. Um, but I want to go way back and I want to go back to my earliest memory in life. Um, when I was about four years old, uh, my father at the time was a sergeant with the Hayward Police Department, which is a suburb outside of Oakland, California. And uh, he was in an interesting position as a sergeant in Hayward Police Department because he was in charge of something called the Youth and Family Services Bureau. 
And it was pretty unique at the time, and it would still even be unique today in that the police department had an entire wing of its, of its station that had uh, police officers, school resource officers, uh, special assault detectives, DV detectives, social workers, their family and marriage therapists, and um, uh, CPS workers. They were all housed together and they collaborated to do investigations that involved crimes against children and crimes involving family and family violence. And as a family member going through trauma or struggling, uh, you could go there for therapy. You could also go there to interact with the prosecutor that handled your case and uh, really have kind of a wraparound approach to dealing with families in crisis. Um, I still, to this day, have not seen an agency that has anything like that. And that was kind of what I grew up in. In fact, uh, my, at some points in my life, my family were struggling with uh, raising two teenage boys. Sometimes that can be a lot of work. Uh, and we actually went there for therapy as a family and, and worked through those, those kind of issues. But when I was about four years old, uh, as I've mentioned, my earliest memory in life, uh, I remember it was a weekend and my mom had something she had to go do and my dad had to work. So she asked my dad if he could take my brother and I to work. And I was about four, my brother was about seven years old at the time. And my dad said it was no problem. He would take us to work with him and it, was, it would be fine because he was just doing equipment maintenance for the SWAT team. And my dad had been a part of starting up a SWAT team for the Hayward Police Department, which in the 1970s was a little bit unique for a kind of medium-sized department to have its own SWAT team. So um, they, uh, they had kind of put together their own equipment. They went to the evidence room and took out like a, a bunch of random equipment. I remember they had a Uzi that they had taken out of evidence, an old um, like Vietnam era uh, M16 machine gun. And uh, I don't even know what a couple of hunting rifles that they use as their SWAT team uh, weapons. Um, so we had gone to work with them that day to do the SWAT team equipment uh, maintenance, which was pretty normal for us. My brother and I spent a lot of time growing up in the police department and we'd go in the gym and, you know, mess around on the equipment while my dad would be doing his work. So that particular day when we got there, we found out that the equipment maintenance was actually a hostage rescue scenario and my brother and I were going to be the hostages. So um, we get there and there was a two story kind of brick building was the police department and on top of that two story building they had one of those gravel tar roofs. And then they had another box on top of that. That was the detective bureau. And it was a room uh, like a large office size and it had a bunch of desks in it. And I remember still that there were a bunch of people lined up against the back wall. And I know now that those were all the dignitaries and police uh, leaders and neighboring agencies and so on. They were all there to see kind of the capabilities of this new SWAT team. And then over in the opposite corner was this desk and my brother and I were being hidden underneath the desk and there was a, a narcotics detective there with his long beard and waving around a fake gun, yelling and screaming, and he was holding us hostage. And next thing I know, the door came flying off the hinges and the SWAT team came rushing in and they neutralized the bad guy and they rescued my brother and I, and then they evacuated us out onto the roof. So now little four-year-old Andy and seven-year-old Patrick and, his, and dad were standing out on the roof and I noticed there were a bunch of ropes hanging off the building. And the SWAT team one at a time started rappelling off the building and uh, pretty soon I looked around, it was just my brother and I and my dad left. And so my dad tied my brother up to the rope and he threw him off the building. And my brother rappelled down and the SWAT team was at the bottom of the rope and they were cheering for him. And um, we were like their little mascot. So they were pretty excited to have us there for the day. And next it was my turn. So my dad tied me up with the rope and I remember him, he, he kind of held me by the scruff of the neck and he held, held me up off, off the side of the building. And I still remember trying to hold onto my dad's hand as he was holding me there and I said, you know, dad, I don't think I want to do this. And he said, sorry, too late. He just opened his hand up and let go. I rappelled down to the bottom of the rope. And I remember the whole SWAT team was down there cheering for me. And I remember one guy in particular was at the bottom of the rope. His name was Dave. And Dave was a huge guy. He was like 6'4", probably 250 pounds of solid muscle. He was a bodybuilder. He was also a motorcycle officer. So I always had those like 1970s motorcycle officer uniform with the mirrored sunglasses and the short hair and the big paroli mustache. And, um, and I remember if the, you know, if you saw him, he was a little bit intimidating. He's a big guy. If the general members of the public saw him, they would be intimidated, right? He was kind of the epitome of 1970s police officer. But I also knew Dave as a human being because growing up, my dad had been his mentor. And Dave went through a lot of struggles with, you know, breaking up with a girlfriend or he got in trouble at work or, or whatever else was going on in his life. And he was struggling with it. Many times I remember him being in our living room you know, upset, crying about what had happened. And my dad had been counseling him through it. And because of the love and support that my dad had given him, I knew that anything that happened, that Dave would be there to help my family and I. Um, and I remember how safe I felt knowing that Dave was at the bottom of this rope as I rappelled down there. And even though it was frightening to know that this guy was there to catch me, made me feel so secure. And it had nothing to do with his physical stature, even though he was an impressive, you know, hulking guy. It had everything to do with the fact that I knew him as a human being. 
and I knew that he'd have my back and that he would protect me and he wouldn't let anything bad happen to me, right? And I, I struggle because the reason I got into law enforcement is that I wanna help protect people who can't protect themselves, protect people who are vulnerable. And I think the public doesn't understand that about us, right? We get in this job to do that hero stuff. We wanna protect people, we wanna save people. And oftentimes the only things that make it in the news are the bad acts, the mistakes that we make. In fact, Dave was an interesting guy Later on, when I got hired by that police department, I was working for Hayward Police Department. And I, at one point, I was a supervisor working in the jail. And Dave actually came in and used excessive force, and I had to report him for that. So here's this guy who had been kind of my idol growing up. And then later, I see him uh, while he was kind of spiraling, making mistakes, and uh, did something totally inappropriate. Eventually, he got a, a psychological disability for that and some of the things that he had done. So I have spent my whole career, about 29 years, working in law enforcement. And the entire time, my goal has always been to help other people outside of law enforcement see us for the human beings we are inside this uniform. And also, I want to do a better job of helping preparing officers and investigators so that they're better able to connect with that human side of themselves because the traditional way of preparing officers to do their job hasn't been adequate. And it hasn't done a good job of protecting the public. And it hasn't done a good job of protecting officers either. So my goal has been to find a better way to give officers better tools, better equipment, better training, and more support within the agency, um, and also encouraging them to get out and know their community and connect with the community so we can get credit for our hard work. It's really frustrating when officers go out there and they try to do the right thing. Uh, they really try to connect with people who are struggling. They try to offer that love and support that people need. Um, but then all it takes is one bad act to, to draw, that aside, draw that away. And again, my goal is to try to fix that. So this training today, that's where it comes from. Uh, and I do a lot of other types of training. Uh, I've been really lucky in law enforcement. Um, I've been with King County Sheriff's Office for about 23 years now. Uh, prior to that, I worked briefly for Port of Seattle Police Department. And then prior to that, I worked down in the state of California. Uh, and I've been really lucky. I've gotten to be a patrol officer, master police officer. Uh, I spent uh, many years as a detective in our special assault unit where I investigated sexual assault, child abuse, elder abuse, family violence, and child death. Um, and in that job, I've learned a lot about how to interact with different people who've gone through trauma. Um, after doing that job, I got promoted to sergeant, and I was a patrol sergeant for a while. Then I went to internal investigations. And one of the things I found out in internal investigations is that the same skills that I learned when dealing with interviews of children and other people who are vulnerable and have been abused are the same skills that we need when we interact with the public when they're complaining or they're concerned about the acts of officers. And they're also the same skills that we need when we interact with officers who are accused of wrongdoing or who do something that harms somebody else or themselves. So really what we're gonna be talking about today is how do we build a better system that's not only protective of officers, but also protective of the community? How do we make people feel safe? How do we make sure that people understand that we as police professionals are worthy of their trust? Um, and then how do we move forward to make sure that we don't just do these things by mistake, which is what most officers do. I think most officers do a really good job of these techniques and tactics we're gonna talk about today, but I wanna find a way that we can do them on purpose and I wanna build them into the systems and how we do things. Uh, I'm fortunate to be joined today by, uh, by Heather Swanson. Heather is a, a recent graduate of UW's Master's of Social Work program. Uh, she's also a survivor of domestic violence and uh, uh, she's gonna be talking a little, a little bit later and telling her story, but Heather, do you wanna briefly introduce yourself? Um, so my name is Heather Dawn Swanson, and um, I just graduated with my MSW from University of Washington, Tacoma. So um, I've just been spending the past eight years focusing on my education and attending domestic violence support groups, learning more about how to avoid um, getting into additional domestic violence, trauma, um, situations, um, and just, I'm, I'm just resilient. I don't know how I've survived this long with everything I've endured. So, but thank you for um, inviting me to part of this. Thank you, Heather. And uh, we're gonna hear a lot more from Heather later about her story. And um, we're gonna use Heather's story as inspiration for us all as uh, investigators about how we can go forward and when we're dealing with somebody who's been through something traumatic, uh, how we can give them that opportunity to have a voice and some choice in the system and, and how we can develop the skill set that helps them actually be more resilient and recover and, 
and hopefully just not make things worse. So, so Project Engage, um, I'll tell you a little bit about this program. Um, a number of years ago, five or six years ago, um, I was contacted by the King County Prosecutor's Office and I was asked to take part in a group that was looking at how officers on patrol specifically and also detectives doing follow-up were investigating domestic violence cases because they were hearing from survivors of DV as well as from um, advocates and prosecutors that the typical patrol officer was not doing a very good job of getting a good, accurate, reliable statement from somebody who had experienced trauma. And in King County, uh, the particular form that they use called a domestic violence supplemental form when they do these investigations at the time was about four pages long and involved a lot of data and a lot of yes and no questions and kind of fill in the blank questions and also gave an opportunity for the survivor to tell their story kind of at the end. And one of the things that was being proposed is that they wanted to add a couple more pages worth of questions because they were concerned that they weren't gathering enough data to make good decisions about lethality and uh, they weren't having enough information that would inform the system to make take steps to protect the survivor. So I was brought in, they started talking about these additional questions they wanted to ask. And I was brought in because I teach a class called procedural justice. Um, and the, the we're gonna get into a little bit later about what procedural justice is, but uh, I was a co-author of a training for Department of Justice that went out across the country on this topic of procedural justice, uh, specifically focused on agencies that had been either under investigation by the federal government for pattern of practice of abuse, or were currently under consent decree, or had experienced a critical incident that was bringing concern from the community about the way they were interacting with the public. So because of that experience, I was brought in to kind of give that procedural justice lens to this discussion. And they started talking about adding two more pages of questions to this form. And I said, I think we should throw the form away and completely and just teach cops how to connect with people, build relationships and get good statements. Because what I had experienced is most officers feel like they're driven by um, a kind of outside forces, like they have to hurry up and get to the next call. Uh, they're not really trained or prepared about how to overcome some reluctance or resistance from survivors. They don't really know how to identify the difference between uh, somebody who's being dishonest with them and somebody who's, who's in trauma and is triggered and is trying to protect themselves from something that's difficult to talk about. Um, and so we started talking about how we could use this concept of procedural justice and trauma-informed interviewing to improve the quality of statements and also increase the, the frequency from which that we could get good statements from people. Because ultimately the goal in doing an investigation is to get accurate and reliable information. So they stepped back and initially they didn't believe me. So they actually went to a whole series of roll calls with Seattle Police Department and King County Sheriff's Office. And in those roll calls, they asked officers about what their perspective of um, domestic violence calls was. And what they found out was that officers were very kind and compassionate and caring human beings who really did not have adequate training and weren't really given the time and the, uh, the ability to slow things down to the point where they could really build these relationships that were necessary to get these statements from DV survivors. So we came back from that, we designed this training. Um, I've gone out now across the, through the region, actually traveled a little bit across the country and, and internationally teaching this class. Um, where we're trying to combine these two concepts of procedural justice and trauma-informed interviewing just to better prepare officers and investigators for how to connect with survivors of trauma. And I've taught this uh, initially in the area of domestic violence and that context I think is really important because it's a really common one where typically the average patrol officer um, is more, most likely to encounter somebody who's been through trauma. Um, but it's really something that works in all settings and, and something that I found when I was a detective in the special assault unit. And when I had first gotten some training that at the time was hosted by Harvard Youth Center for Sexual Assault and Traumatic Stress. And it was a training on how to conduct trauma-informed interviewing with children, a forensic interview school or child interview schools, what it used to be called. Uh, what I found out was that up until that point, I had been a really good cop. Uh, I was assertive, I would go out there and uh, chase bad guys and make a lot of arrests and I really thought I was doing a good job of getting statements from people and giving them opportunity to tell their story. But I was really learn, uh, really had learned a way to connect with people in a way that made them feel much more comfortable and likely to provide that information I needed to do my job. So what we try to do is take that information I learned from that school and combine it with the information from procedural justice just to better prepare officers and investigators. So that's how it all started. That's what Project Engage is. Um, where is it going? Uh, we're looking for opportunities to teach it more. Again, I, I think that this is uh, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are things that you already know, things that you've already done. Uh, but I, again, my concern is that we're doing it by mistake or we're doing it intermittently and we're not doing it as part of an expectation. 
and we're not doing it on purpose. So the goal is to roll this out. Um, all of this information we're going to talk about today, I'm more than happy to share it with you. And as investigators, uh, if you want to go back to your agency and, and take pieces of this to share with your patrol officers, or if you want to contact me, I'm happy to come out there as well. Uh, but again, I think some of these concepts have been very helpful for officers who are trying to do the right thing and just haven't really been trained in how to do it. So today, uh, my goal is to give you guys plenty of breaks. Uh, I don't want to uh, try to traumatize you uh, by subjecting you to a full day of PowerPoint and discussion. I'm going to try to be a little bit interactive. Uh, I'm going to make use of chat um, because in this setting, that's pretty much the easiest way for us to share information. Uh, but uh, as we go through this today, I just uh, would hope that um, that you get a little bit of information that you can use. And if there's anything I can do to help, I'd, I'd love to do that. But we're going to take plenty of breaks. Uh, our goal is to be done a little bit before four o'clock. Uh, I also am going to have one more person. Heather's going to be joining me this morning. And then after lunch, uh, we're also going to be joined by a woman named Elba. She's from the Domestic Abuse Women's Network. And she's going to talk a little bit about advocacy and um, what an advocate does to support uh, survivors of trauma. Uh, and they're going to talk from two perspectives. They're going to talk a little bit about system-based advocacy as well as community-based advocacy and what are the differences. Uh, one of the things I found out in this project is that a lot of investigators and officers really don't know what advocates do. Um, I actually am married to an advocate, so I know very well what advocates do. Um, and it's a very different perspective than what we have in law enforcement. So I think it's valuable to hear a little bit from them as well. So the goal of instruction today um, the students will demonstrate application of procedural justice by following trauma-informed intervening principles to gain trust and cooperation of a person who has experienced trauma. So uh, part of what we're going to do today is going to involve journaling. Uh, if those of you who logged in late, there's a link in the, in the chat um, to a, um, something called a self-reflective journal. If you had an opportunity to print this ahead of time, that's great. Uh, most people prefer kind of taking notes on the form directly. Um, but if you didn't have a chance to print it and you can open it up and have it available as a PDF and you have some somewhere to take notes, that, that's also a way to do this. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about journaling. This is something I'm pretty passionate about. Um, it's, it's kind of a somewhat new within the last 10 or so years uh, way of uh, teaching I've been experimenting with. And I found it to be very helpful, uh, especially when we're talking about concepts or ideas or techniques uh, that require a little bit of a, a, a shift in the way we approach things, the way we think. So what's the goal for journaling? The goal for journaling is self-reflection. As adults, we learn differently than children do. And one of the things that adults uh, are, can really benefit from is taking time to self-reflect when they do training, especially when you go through training online or through virtual means like Zoom today. Um, if you just sit there and kind of sit back and absorb it, sometimes you can have a really motivational speaker. Sometimes you can have somebody who has some really good information. Uh, but if you really don't take that time to step back and self-reflect on what they said and thinking about how you can personalize it for yourself, you're really going to miss a lot of the opportunities to learn from the training. So we're going to intentionally build in a little bit of self-reflection today. Um, the other piece that helps adults learn is collaboration. Um, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some tools. I'm going to encourage you to go out and collaborate with other people to try to turn this into something. So not only are we going to give you the skills, we're going to ask you to self-reflect on those skills. And then I'm going to ask you to take those skills and go out and collaborate with other people to improve your skill set and the resources available to survivors. Really the foundation of journaling and self-reflection is about emotional and social intelligence. Uh, this is something that we've done a horrible job of training officers about in law enforcement. And luckily we hire some really good people and a lot of officers are really good at, uh, at these emotional and social intelligence skills. Uh, but uh, I'm frustrated because uh, as a police chief, um, I see it all the time when we don't necessarily hire, train, or promote people based on these skills. And yet I would say that emotional and social intelligence are the most important skills that an officer can have. We also wanna use this journaling today to build empathy. Uh, empathy is a, a critical skill to have. Uh, in America, we have an abundance of sympathy where we saw, feel sorry for other people. Um, empathy is the next step up, and that means that we can walk in somebody's shoes and understand their suffering. But I also want to take it a step farther than that. The reason most of us got into law enforcement is because we want to save people, right? We want to be a rescuer. We want to be a protector. And in order to be a rescuer or a protector, um, we need to have sympathy to identify need. We need to have that empathy to understand that need and that suffering. But then we're also going to develop compassion. And compassion is having the sympathy to identify, having the empathy to understand, but then actually doing something about it. And that's what law enforcement is, right? That's what our job is all about. It's about being compassionate people 
And what I want to do is give you another skill set that's going to help you show that compassion to other people when they're suffering. And also, I want to use the journaling to help you develop leadership. Um, the stuff we're going to talk about today is not just a model for investigators or officers and when they inter interact with, with, with trauma survivors out in the field. It's also a leadership model, right? And before I, as a police leader, can ask somebody who works for me to go out and interact this way with the public, I need to make sure that I'm interacting this way with them inside the station and when I interact with them as a, as a supervisor. If we don't have trauma-informed strategies with how we interact with our own officers, how can I expect them to be prepared emotionally and have the right skill sets to go out there and do this with the public? How can I even expect them to be uh, emotionally prepared to go out there and deal with somebody else's trauma when they've been exposed to trauma that's not been dealt with? So the leadership aspect of this, all of you are going to leave with some skills that I hope you can go back and it's going to help you take care of each other. Anybody who lived in America in the year 2020 and so far 2021 as well is a trauma survivor. And we need to give ourselves a little bit of credit for that. Uh, we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace and we need to understand that right now we really need to support each other because uh, Americans in general, but law enforcement specifically is really suffering with some of the things that have happened recently. And we're, we need to be there to support each other through that. So traditional instructional model means that people come in and they tell inspirational stories. They may talk about uh, ideas or research that are emerging, and they may talk to people about best practices. Uh, the problem with traditional instruction model is it's really good for a factory worker. Our entire education system was built on this desire to become an industrialized society. And we have people who sit back and they give us these ideas and we just sit there and absorb them and, and, and never are really encouraged to do much with it. So the shift today, we're going to use some adult learning principles with this self-reflective journaling, um, because with the traditional style of instruction, it was limited interaction. There was limited transfer of information. And what we know about adult brains is you are much more likely to retain and use information that you, uh, that you gain in training if you do have in interactions and if you are able to transfer that to new, new settings or contexts or, or other areas that you uh, can spend time thinking about and, and reflecting on. So the adult learning uh, model involves expert mentors. Uh, myself and Jessica and Heather today are gonna provide some mentoring to you about what you can do with these skills. And the expert mon monitors are gonna help you create a personalized experience. Uh, from that, we're gonna develop some measurable results. Uh, what gets measured gets done. And in our society and in our profession right now, we often aren't measuring the right things. I'm gonna talk later during procedural justice about what I think we should be measuring. Uh, we're also going to develop transferable knowledge. As I mentioned, this knowledge doesn't just work in dealing with trauma survivors. It's going to work. Uh, I noticed for myself when I learned these skills that it made me a better father, a better husband, a better friend, a better supervisor, and a better investigator. And I hope that you'll get some skills that will help you in all those areas today. I want to encourage lifelong learning. Um, the, it's, it's a brief class today. This is something that takes a lot of time to really develop and get to know in depth. And I hope that I can inspire you a little bit to go out there and learn more about it and practice these skills outside of this uh, virtual classroom today. Uh, and I also want to talk about organizational development, right? These concepts, these ideas about being a trauma-informed organization and having a trauma-informed culture uh, is not about a hashtag. It's not about um, you know, uh, any of these uh, kind of polarizing concepts. It's really just about understanding when somebody's been through trauma, how do we handle them? And even within our own organization, we need to do a better job of that. But our organization needs to create space and time for investigators to really be able to take the time it needs to develop relationships that are gonna allow them to get the information they need from trauma survivors. So here's the plan. Step one, uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna actively participate in training today. It's gonna involve guided note-taking. It's a pretty large class today for a virtual environment. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna have the time to do the role play exercises that we typically would do in this class. Instead, I'm gonna be doing some demonstrations of these different skills. And then all of you will have the opportunity to take notes in the self-reflective journal as we go through the training. And what you'll notice is on the uh, PowerPoint slides, I'm gonna have a little asterisk and a number, and that's gonna indicate which section of the self-reflective journal that I'm talking about. And oftentimes what I'm doing is I'm giving you the answers to the test there. So as we go through it, uh, you can fill in those uh, kind of fill in the blank things. And, as we talk through this a little bit more, I want you to understand how relevant this guided note-taking is going to be later on when you try to develop an action plan. From the guided note-taking, we're then going to uh, do something called DPA, or Describe Personalized Action Plan. Describe is the what. You're going to take the information that you're presented today, and you're going to convert it into your own words. You're going to describe, as an example, what is trauma-informed interviewing, or what is procedural justice. 
when I just sit here and talk to you, if you just regurgitate exactly what I said, it's not as meaningful as, as if you translate it into your own words so that you have a deeper understanding of it. The next piece of it, after you describe that topic, I'm going to have you personalize it, and that's the why. So I want you to talk about if you now can say what is procedural justice or what is trauma-informed interviewing, now why is that relevant to you, right? What experience or training or, or life exposures do you have that help you understand this topic? How are you going to go out there and use it? Uh, what mistakes have you made in the past that now make more sense? What successes have, have you had in the past that, that now you understand better? Um, so that personalized piece of it allows you to take the general information and make it personal to you. And then the last part of it is you're going to develop an action plan, and that's the how. It's no, it, it, almost no help at all if you learn some great new information if you don't actually turn it into action, right? This is where we, we, we go from empathy to compassion. It's when we turn that empathy into something that's actionable. So the how is something we're going to spend some time about. So when we develop that action plan, we want it to be a smart goal. We want it to be specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound. Uh, essentially, I'm going to help walk you through that process of developing something that may sound something similar to when I encounter a person who I recognize as uh, being a survivor of trauma, I'm going to apply trauma-informed interview principles in the context of procedural, procedurally just um, systems to try to meet their needs, right? So again, that's just off the top of my head, that's a specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound uh, action plan. And I'm going to start to use that. And over time, I'm going to try to develop my skill set. Step two is going to use the inspiration to seek more information, right? So we do the guided note-taking. We develop our described personalized action plan. That's our self-reflective journal. From that, we're going to gather that knowledge. We're going to journal about it. We're going to seek input from others. Um, based on the input that we get, we're going to revise those journals. We're going to experiment with them in the real world to see what works and what doesn't. And as I find out what works and what doesn't, I'm going to make those modifications to my journal and modifications to my action plan so that I can, I can make better use of them in the real world. From that, I'm going to assemble a portfolio. That's basically kind of my binder of knowledge, that information that I have. Um, and then when I'm going into an, an interview or, or a circumstance where I need to go in there and pull out information from the past, uh, that's where I can go. I'm going to have it ready for me. This is what this is going to do. This um, is help us establish best practices. That's where we use things like research that we conduct, as well as stuff that we go out and read about. Uh, this is where we do our own studying, collaboration, and reform. Uh, this involves seeking feedback from others and continually revising our plan. Step three is implement. Uh, when we're going to take that action plan, we're going to use it to develop relationships, not just with survivors in the moment. But also in advance, we want to develop relationships with people who are going to support us, whether it be our prosecutor's office or victim advocacy organizations, other groups that are going to help support us in, in interviewing survivors of trauma. It's going to allow us to showcase our achievements and show people that we care about these topics, that we're really trying to put them into action and make changes to our system to make it more just and more supportive of people who have been through trauma. And ultimately, the goal is that we want to improve outcomes. Step four, we're gonna measure, measure the performance. It's gonna help us identify strengths and weaknesses internal to our, our own way of thinking, our own system, as well as opportunities and threats. And those are those external uh, issues that we need to identify and try to address. When we measure that performance, it's gonna help us steer our programs and the people within our programs. If we're a supervisor, it's gonna help us give direction to the people who work for us. If we're an investigator, it's gonna help us plan for our cases and how we're gonna approach different settings. And then step five, we wanna we want to commit to lifelong learning. We want to develop a growth mindset. Uh, we want to try to develop ourselves as individuals, and we want to try to develop our organization, right? Uh, it's really easy in our line of work to kind of get stuck in the bureaucracy of policing and the bureaucracy of the criminal justice system. Uh, but if we're constantly going out there to try to improve ourselves and improve the system, uh, people can feel that. And, and that's what helps us uh, maintain those relationships and establish trust. So as we go through the journaling, if you, if you do have that journal printed, if you want to flip to the last two pages, uh, this is where we're going to, you might want to take notes throughout the day, and then later you'll make your final copy of it. On page number four, uh, it gives you some uh, place to write your describe and personalize. And the two things we're going to describe today are going to be trauma-informed interviewing and procedural justice. And then you're going to have an opportunity to personalize those two topics. And then the last page, page five, this is your action plan. And this is actually a script that you're going to develop so that when you have an opportunity to interact with somebody who's been through trauma, it's going to give you a little bit of guidance about how you're going to be able to do that successfully. Now, I don't want you to feel like you have to 
read from a script when you interact with somebody who's been through trauma. In fact, I think reading from the script can detract from uh, building the relationship. Uh, but going through this process of actually creating this journal and writing it down is the first step in actually internalizing these ideas. And even if you don't follow your script precisely because you're doing it from memory, you're going to be much more likely to meet most of the objectives that we have today just by going through this process of creating this journal. So it's really easy to sit in this training and just sit there and listen. It's, it's your option. That's up to you. I would encourage you to take a little bit of time during the training and then after to write down some of your thoughts because that act of processing, thinking about and writing it down is gonna be huge for helping you actually change the way you do things for the better. And again, if you're already doing everything correctly, I want you to get credit for that. And this is an opportunity, opportunity for you to do that as well. So there's the personalize, the why, the action plan, the how. And again, ideally those are gonna be specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time bound objectives. So expectations for today. First of all, there, uh, there is an expectation of privacy. Um, obviously, it's a, a pretty large class for a virtual training. Um, you have an opportunity to, if you, uh, you will have some chances maybe to speak a little bit. We're going to make use of chat. If you want to change your name to only use your first name or a moniker or whatever else, that's fine uh, if you want to maintain your privacy there. Uh, but I do think that these, even though this class is being recorded, I, I want to be able to have open and meaningful discussions today. Uh, myself and Heather are really putting ourselves out there today. We're, we're, we're going to be very vulnerable today when we tell our stories, and, and we would hope that, um, that you can use those uh, appropriately to help you kind of guide the way you do things in the future. Uh, we also, I, I want to encourage listening. So we often in our job, we're thinking about the next good thing to say, right? When you sit here in a class, you may be listening to something I'm saying, or maybe you've completely tuned me out already. That's fine. I, I, I have thick skin. Uh, but while you're listening today, though, sometimes we spend a little bit too much time processing. I'm going to build in time for processing. And what I ask you to do is actually focus on listening. Um, if you notice yourself kind of drifting, I want to teach you an acronym right now, the WAIT acronym, W-A-I-T. And that WAIT acronym is, why am I talking? And sometimes it's talking to yourself. Sometimes it's talking to somebody else. When we're doing a trauma-informed interviewing, I use that WAIT acronym to slow myself down. And if the person's talking to me and I'm talking too much or I'm spending too much time processing, it means I'm not present in the moment. I'm not really paying attention. And I'm often gonna miss something important that that person's saying. So while you're going through this today, I'm gonna ask that you try to, try to listen. The guided note-taking is an opportunity for you to write some things down. Uh, but particularly today when Heather is telling her story, I'm gonna ask you to really slow, slow down your brain, really focus on what she's saying. And then after she talks, we're going we're gonna to come back and circle around and talk a little bit in more detail about how we process what she had to say. Uh, respect. Uh, I'm going to do my best to be respectful to all of you today. I'm going to stick to my timeline. I'm, I'm, I'm working really hard to try to present information that's hopefully relevant and meaningful to you. Uh, and all I ask is that you also uh, show us that same amount of respect. Um, uh, you know, I, it's, there's no question uh, off limits today. I want you to be able to be open and and uh, ask those difficult questions of both myself and Heather today. This is a good opportunity in a safe environment to have those, those discussions, but we still need to do it in a respectful way. And I'm just gonna ask you to commit to learning, right? A lot of the stuff I'm gonna say today is stuff that you already know, um, but I wanna challenge you a little bit to stretch yourself and think about new ways to apply these, these tactics and techniques. Uh, again, if our goal is to protect people, to, if our goal is to make people safer, um, we need to commit to uh, trying new strategies, trying new approaches, and, and really trying to grow as, as, as people working within the system. So in a more broad sense, when we talk about trauma-informed interviewing today, there are some different expectations. And I want to talk about those briefly because these are not only things that I want to talk about in the context of trauma-informed interviewing, but today during this class, this is kind of a mutual understanding that we need to have between each other as well. So the first expectation is safety, right? Uh, the goal of today is to create more community and officer safety. Uh, we want to create an environment where everybody's able to speak their mind, uh, particularly Heather telling her story later. She's going to have to really be vulnerable and expose herself. And I want to make sure that when she does that, that we're going to be here to be supportive of her. The other goal today is going to be empowerment. Uh, I want to empower all of you to take this information and go out there and get credit for your hard work. Uh, to maybe improve the way you're doing or continue doing really good work uh, with some new ideas or new perspectives possibly. Uh, but when we talk about trauma-informed interviewing, creating safety and empowering people is a huge part of getting people to give us accurate and reliable information. The next part of this is trust. Uh, we need to be able to trust each other. Uh, a lot of that has to do with integrity. 
everything I say today, I mean, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to tell you how I really feel. And I ask you to do the same. And then collaboration. Uh, this is a partnership that we have. Uh, when you're working with a survivor who's been through trauma, they need to feel and they need to believe, and you need to feel and believe that it's a relationship that's built on collaboration, uh, which also means that this person must be given a choice. Right? And that's something that's difficult for officers to kind of let go of control. In order to have somebody uh, give somebody a true choice, it means that we may lose some control. And we're talking about somebody who's been through, through trauma, we can all think about circumstances where we've been traumatized, where we've been struggling. And by given, being given a choice about whether or not to participate, a choice about how we participate, a choice about taking breaks, about accessing other resources, about getting that support that we need, that's a huge part of being able to feel comfortable enough to tell our story. So again, these are the expectations for today, but these are also the expectation that we use when we deal with a trauma survivor and we're trying to get, in, get information from them. We need to create safety, we need to empower, we need to create trust, we need to collaborate, and we need to offer choice. So as I mentioned before, um, my name is Andy McCurdy. Uh, I'm here today uh, working in, under my business, Sarge Training, and I'm just going to be talking to you today about trauma-informed interviewing and procedural justice. Um, as I mentioned, my real job is that I'm a chief of police uh, for Contract City. I call myself a ceremonial chief because I still work for the sheriff's office. And if I do something stupid, as long as it's not too stupid, I just go back to the sheriff's office. But uh, fortunately, uh, the city of Covington is a great place to work. And uh, I've really enjoyed that. I've talked to you a little bit about my past experience and, and why I'm here today talking to you about this topic. Um, but the goal today is to kind of help facilitate a little bit of learning and give you guys an opportunity to journal about it so that you can actually take this learning to the next step and apply it. And to your to your world. Uh, for the documentation today, as I mentioned, there's a self-reflective journal. This training is being recorded, uh, and that's being recorded so that the uh, project uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods can share this with other uh, other uh, investigators who weren't here today. And now I want you to do your first journaling exercise. So if you look at number one in your journal, it says I want you to personalize all three portions of an introduction. The first one is, I want you to think about how you would introduce yourself. What are the elements that are going to be important for a trauma survivor to know when you introduce yourself to that person, right? What do they want to know about you? What do they want to know about your background? Uh, what do they want to know about your purpose for being there? The next part is a neutral job description and then explaining documentation. Now, you have a couple options today, depending on what your role is. If you're an investigator, a patrol officer, a prosecutor, whatever that may be, this may look a little bit different. But I, I just went through the process of introducing myself. It looks a little different if I were to do that with a trauma survivor. And in a few minutes here, when I talk, have Heather tell her story, I'm actually going to go through and introduce myself like it's the first time I met her to kind of demonstrate some of these concepts of trauma-informed interviewing. But as we're going through this today, I want you to take a few minutes and start to take some notes about how you would introduce yourself, how would you provide a neutral job description, and how would you explain documentation to a trauma survivor so that they're better prepared and better understanding of of what you're gonna be doing next. And remember the fundamentals we're talking about here are safety, being trustworthy and transparent, collaborative, empowering, giving them voice and a choice, being respectful to the whole person. So a lot of the top stuff I'm gonna talk about today is actually comes from Harvey Youth Center for Sexual Assault and Traumatic Stress. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, one of the, the best trainings I've ever been to in my career was the child interview school that they hosted that training is now managed by the Criminal Justice Training Center in, in Burien. And um, if you ever have an opportunity, if you've never been to that training as an investigator or police officer, I would really encourage you to do it. I think it's a three or four day training now. And then there's a, a fourth or fifth day that's optional, the kind of the more advanced piece. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking today comes from that training. At the end of the day, I'm going to give you a one page document that actually was created by Harborview as part of the Project Engage uh, program. And it's basically kind of a cheat sheet that you can use uh, to help guide you through these interviews. Uh, my goal, though, is to actually have you produce your journal version of this first, one that's personalized for you. And then I'm going to give you Harborview's version of it. And I think that once, if you create your own version of it first, then the version that they, I give you from them is going to make a little more sense. Um, again, the, the goal is to not sound like we're reading from a script when we interview somebody who's been through trauma. Our goal is actually to, to seem authentic and to seem credible by taking that little bit of time to do a better job of um, uh, building trust and presenting ourselves as, as worthy of that trust. So with that, um, it's about six minutes till. My goal is to try to take a break um, by, by 10 o'clock. Uh, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. 
uh, that's going to mean that um, uh, Heather's, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, I'm going to ask for some information from all of you. And then Heather's going to talk a little bit here. So I have to change my screen for a minute. Okay. Um, for some reason, I'm having trouble seeing chat. There it is. Okay, um, so this is something that I'm going to ask you guys to talk about in chat just a little bit. So if you have access to the keyboard, if you can kind of prepare your fingers right now, um, what I want you to put in there is when you hear the word survival, what do you think of? What does survival mean to you? And now this can be from two contexts. This can be in your personal life. This can be your work life. What is survival? What does it mean to you to survive? Now, most of us, when we hear that survival, we're going to think about um, life and death, right? And that's a huge part of our job, especially in law enforcement. Uh, it can be a dangerous job. Um, sometimes we, um, uh, sometimes we encounter dangerous situations where our survival is in question. So, uh, somebody put in chat resilience uh, mentality, right? The when we talk about resilience, it's about surviving the struggles or trauma, uh, surviving politics. Um, I was not aware that there were pol political issues in America today, but if you say so, I'll believe you. Um, <laughs> not getting charged with a crime for doing my job, right? Uh, officers right now are afraid. Um, officers right now are trying to struggle to understand how to do their jobs effectively and not get themselves in trouble with all the legislation that came out. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of fear, um, and we don't make our best decisions when we're afraid. So trying to figure out what the politics are so that we can be, be safe in doing our jobs and protect ourselves from Lawsuits or criminal charges is a huge part. Somebody else put in there, moving forward after an emotional um, traumatic event, all right? A huge part of that recovery is uh, understanding what happened and then moving forward. That's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. Somebody put bare minimum at the end of a rope after trauma. So when we go through trauma, uh, you know, when we talk about resilience, uh, one of the things I've noticed in law enforcement is at times I've seen officers who view somebody who's been through something traumatic and they look at, uh, there's almost a view that that person may have um, created a circumstance or left themselves vulnerable. And there almost is like this viewpoint that a person may be weak or there's a weakness because of the circumstances they found themselves in. But when we talk about resilience, resilience really talks about going through this traumatic experience and still living after, right? And sometimes that how you live after may not look the same as how you lived before, but these struggles and traumas that we go through oftentimes create who we are. And sometimes that means just surviving with the bare minimum. So for that comment there, you know, being at the end of your robe after trauma, um, that is still resilience, you know, still recovering that, that survival piece of things is huge. So any other thoughts, what else is survival? So, you know, for me, when I got into law enforcement, one of my goals was to protect people. And when I think about survival, uh, one of the things that I think can be very stressful for officers is we're not only worried about our own survival, but we're more worried about the survival of the public, especially people who are vulnerable. Uh, and when we go through doing our job, uh, sometimes our job can make people feel more safe or less safe, right? And when we talk about survival, um, we hopefully can do things that are going to create safety for the public and for ourselves at the same time. Uh, but there is kind of that push and pull. We need to put ourselves in danger sometimes to protect people, and, and, and that can be difficult. So survival can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Now what I want you to put in, in, in chat is what are some of the challenges and stressors that get in the way of survival? I'm going to tell you a personal story. Um, so I have, a, I have three kids. I have a 19-year-old daughter. Uh, when my daughter was about a year old, I went through a divorce, and uh, my ex-wife and I split up. It was a very amicable divorce. And um, after, uh, you know, I had never really thought about myself being a father. Uh, once I became a father, I, I felt that it was my calling. I, I'm a good dad. I uh, really enjoy spending time with my daughter. And after about a year of being divorced, things were great. I, uh, at the time I was a detective in our special assault unit. Um, I had Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays off. Uh, my ex-wife was a patrol officer and she had uh, weekdays off. So we were both able to spend time with our daughters on our days off. And then we had one common work day where we would alternate who had to provide childcare for her. So uh, things were going along great. And then I remember on June 30th, uh, I was at home getting ready for work. 
And I remember it was June 30th because uh, working for the King County Sheriff's Office, I uh, uh, have to qualify with my handgun twice a year, once between January 1st and June 30th, and then again between July 1st and December 31st. What was the last day I, to qualify for the first half of the year and I had not yet done so. So I was getting ready for work and there was a knock at the door. And I opened up the door and there was some guy there that threw some paperwork at me and said, you've been served, All right? I picked it up and it was noticed from my ex-wife that she was relocating to Maryland and that she was gonna take my daughter with her. And when we had gotten our divorce, uh, we had gotten one of those kind of quick and easy, cheap divorces. And the attorney that helped us fill out the paperwork basically told us that we had to designate a primary parent, but that it didn't really mean anything. Uh, well, what it did mean was that my ex-wife could relocate and there really wasn't much I could do about it. So I was kind of spinning, I was concerned, I was traumatized, I was scared. Um, and I jumped in my car and I drove out to the range. And uh, when I got out there uh, to do my qualification, uh, and up to that point, I'd been, I'd been carrying a gun my entire adult life. Uh, qualifying with my gun had never really been a problem. Uh, but that day I was, I was pretty upset about finding out that my daughter may move across country and, and not be near me. Um, so uh, I get up to the first stage of fire and luckily the two firearms instructors, I was the only one there and there were two instructors helping me and they were both friends of mine. When I got up to the first stage of fire, um, they said, okay, is the line ready? Line is ready, fire. And when I drew my gun, I punched my gun up on target. My magazine fell out. I was like, hey, can I do that over again? Pretend that didn't happen. Oh yeah, no problem. So I reinsert my magazine, holster up my gun, had my do over. Okay, is, is the line ready? Line is ready, fire. This time when I drew my gun, I punched up on target. My gun fell out of my hand and bounced down range. I just went and picked up my gun. I said, I'm going home sick. Called up my sergeant. They called up my sergeant. And I told him, you know, I, I can't do it today. I'm just going home. And, um, you know, it was completely unrelated to work. And yet it was a huge stressor and challenge that I was facing that was making me my question, my ability to kind of survive in that moment. You know, I didn't know what it was going to, what life was going to look like. I was concerned. I was afraid. Um, I know that here in chat, somebody put in here, fear of the unknown family being, uh, being uncomfortable, um, people who want to hurt us, you know, politicians who submit to mob rule to crucify officers for political gain, uh, right? When we face these challenges and stressors, it means that we can't see survival, right? And these challenges and stressors often will pull us away from the things that are important and help us and make it difficult for us to stay focused on this difficult job that we're doing. So first of all, one of the things we need to do is we need to identify for us in that moment, what is survival, especially when we're facing something that's difficult or challenging. Um, and then, sorry, sorry, my watch is uh, apparently thinks I'm doing a workout right now. Um, so when we face these challenges and stressors, it makes us fear that we aren't gonna achieve survival and uh, it can detract us, it makes us make, so that we're not making as good a decision. So when we think about the way the human brain works, I think my trauma is a deeply distressing or disturbing event, right? And we think about different types of trauma. There are big traumas, you know, sexual assault, times of war, all these things that we think about when we hear the word trauma, but there's also small T traumas, right? Small traumas that we may be exposed to, things that happen at home or at work, that make it difficult for us to feel like we're really going to survive or thrive in our life, right? So from the police perspective, when we look at what's going on in America today, we look at politics, we look at a lot of these other things that um, people are being critical of us. And oftentimes, like for me as an officer, I see these things that happen in another part of the country or even another part of the world where an officer does something that makes us all look bad. And I get frustrated because I can say, honestly, I wouldn't do those same things in that circumstance, right? And the public is judging me based on what this other person is doing. And that kind of further traumatizes us, right? So we have a traumatic event and then we're being judged for those acts of another. So when we talk about trauma, one of the things I want, want to make sure we understand is what is trauma really doing? Well, trauma is basically changing the way we perceive the world around us and how we process new information. So when we think about trauma, if we look at, there's something, there's something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and Maslow is a scientist, and actually this theory has been debunked. I'm using this as a, a kind of a graphic to help illustrate a point here. But when we talk about survival, the lower level of, of survival means that we're, we need our physiological needs met, right? We need food, we need shelter, we need water. If we don't have those needs met, it's hard to move up to the next level of survival, right? So again, first need, layer of needs is we need to have our physiological needs met. Once we have those needs met, we're able to move on to our safety needs, right? We need to feel like we're safe. Uh, if you think, I like to prepare, compare everything in the world now to either primitive man or the animal kingdom, because I think that that helps in my brain, helps me make sense of things. 
if you think to a uh, caveman or cave woman, you know, 30,000 years ago, huddled around their fire, uh, and they're afraid that there's a saber-toothed tiger in the bushes behind them that's going to attack them at any moment as soon as nightfall comes. So they're, they're sitting there and they're preparing their file, fire, and because they know that the saber-toothed tiger is, is behind them, it's going to attack, uh, they're fumbling, right? They've lost fine motor skill, their heart rate and their blood pressure increases, they're sweating, they have tunnel vision, auditory exclusion, all these things that we know we experience during times of stress. Like if any of you have been in an officer involved shooting or some other critical event, these are things that we know we experience, right? So even though their physiologic needs may be met, when they feel unsafe, we're not able to perform as well, right? That you think about that caveman or cave woman trying to build their fire to protect their family when they know that saber tooth tiger is behind them. The problem is it doesn't matter whether or not that saber tooth tiger is really there. Trauma and, and survival are about whether or not we perceive that we're, our life is in threat. So when we have our physiological needs met, we're able to move on to their safety needs. And if those safety needs aren't met in real or even just in our, in our mind at the time, it's difficult for us to move on to the next layer of needs. The next layer of needs is belonging, right? Once we know we've got our physiological needs met, we know that we feel safe. Now as human beings, we wanna feel like we belong to something, right? That's about having a community. That's about having relationships and trust. Uh, that sense of belonging gives us purpose in life. Once we have our physiological needs met, our safety needs are being met, we have a sense of belonging. The next part of it is our self-esteem, right? We need to feel good about ourselves. We need to have fulfillment. Uh, we need to do something that matters, right? Uh, most officers I talk to are operating up in this esteem area where they, they need it. Right, right now, I, I think in our profession, we're really struggling to have that fulfillment and feel like what we do is really important and meaningful. And I think when we're really struggling here in this area of esteem, it means that uh, we always can't perform at the highest level that's needed for us. And then the highest level is self, right? We need to have a good sense of ourself, know where we fit into the world. Uh, that's about things like emotional and social intelligences. Um, and when we're doing these investigations, when we're really trying to connect with somebody who's been through trauma, we need to be living up in that highest level in that area of self where we can really understand what we're doing. We can stay focused on the other person because we know that our physiological needs have been met. We feel safe. We have a sense of belonging. We have, we have high self-esteem because we feel like our work is meaningful. And now we can connect with the other human, human being and to make sure we provide for them what we need, right? And when we talk about these issues in our society right now, where a lot of us in law enforcement are struggling, it's because we don't feel like our, our agency, our community, or the public in general, uh, or even politicians for that matter, are really supporting us. And, and it makes us kind of psychologically drop down into this area of safety. And even though we know that physically we may be safe, sometimes we're not, uh, we become fearful about and, and more likely to think that we're unsafe if those higher level needs aren't being met as well. So I'd like to use this kind of this pyramid as we go through because First of all, I wanna be able to reflect back on ourselves and understand where we are, right? If you truly fear for your safety right now, it's gonna be really hard for you to do a good, meaningful, trauma-informed interview with somebody because your own safety needs aren't being met. And we need to understand that and embrace that and try to do what we can to build safety for ourselves so that we can then move forward and, and build safety for somebody else. And again, I use this to kind of illustrate some points about where we may be on this while we're doing these, these types of uh, investigations. So now uh, the next part of our journaling exercises, and I've kind of been blown through them in the background. Uh, if you have your self-reflective journal open, uh, one, something I wrote in there is what is survival to you? I saw uh, some things in chat where people are concerned about um, the safety of doing their job. They, they somebody, uh, you know, either politics or other job circumstances that make them feel unsafe. Uh, for you right now, survival may mean not feeling safe and secure doing your work, right? Uh, Survival may mean family. Maybe you have something going on in your personal life that makes it hard. Um, I want you to talk, think a little bit, and then write out there what is survival to you, what means, what's important to you right now. And then I want you to think about five challenges and stressors that, that have the potential to negatively impact your performance and how you might minimize those, right? So if the politics of the day, if the changes to our policy, if going off of another bad call or is something that you're gonna be challenged with when you go into an interview with a trauma survivor, you need to have the self-awareness and the emotional intelligence to be aware of what you're struggling with uh, because it's really difficult to be present and uh, be there to support somebody else who's vulnerable if you feel really vulnerable at the time as well. So, um, so this journal piece, I want you to think about the challenges and stressors. Um, and now we're gonna be shifting a little bit. Um, and I want you to put something in chat for me. And again, this, I know most of you are violent crime investigators, 
We're going to talk a little bit from the domestic violence perspective because I think that that's relevant, especially with what Heather's going to be talking to us about here. Uh, but I want you to put in chat now, when you hear the word DV in progress, what does that mean to you? If you're working patrol or you get sent out as a detective to a domestic violence in progress call, what do you think that means typically? DV in progress. happening in actual time, right? So if you're getting sent to a DV in progress, it means right now there's domestic violence. What does the word DV mean in that context? To individuals who have exceeded their coping skills. It's called about an argument or a fight involving people in a domestic situation. So when we went out to roll calls and we started talking to officers about this idea of domestic violence, it says uh, assault in progress between family members. I know in my agency, the word DV in progress has almost completely lost its meaning. It basically means that there's two people who may or may not be getting along in the moment, right? And oftentimes officers are thrown in these situations where we have years, decades, lifetimes of, of conflict, and, and now we're sent in there to try to, try to sort that out, right? Try to help people. Um, we have to figure out what their relationships are. We have to figure out what the history is. We need to find out what happened, whether or not there was a crime. And that's a lot to sort through for a patrol officer, right? And one of the struggles we had um, when we started doing this training is that officers had every intention of going in there and trying to identify somebody who's vulnerable and try to protect them, try to take steps to in ensure somebody's safety. But oftentimes they were encountering situations where people were either reluctant or resistant to the, the help that the officers were offering um, or um, wanted no part at all in anybody outside their family, even though they were going through uh, a, a domestic violence or a struggle or a dispute with a family member. They wanted no support at all from anybody outside their household. And the officers were being thrown in there and they felt obligated to take action. We have mandatory arrest laws. We have requirements that we take action if we can identify somebody who's committed a crime within four hours and there's an injury, so on and so forth. Um, but it really has put officers in a difficult position because the word DV in progress often doesn't mean what we think it means or what it was intended to mean. And I remember hearing a story from one of our officers in a roll call where they were talking about, they got sent out to investigate a domestic violence in progress in a parking lot in a car. And when they got there, um, there was uh, a male and a female. Um, the, the female was accusing the male of um, uh, intimidating her. And the male was saying that the only reason she was mad was because he stopped paying her phone bill. And they spent about an hour with these two trying to figure out if there was a crime, if there wasn't, if they had to do anything. And neither of the people um, were very cooperative. There was a lot of concern about uh, substance abuse, a lot of concern about um, you know, just unhealthy living situation. There were kids involved and the officers felt obligated to do something even though there was no evidence that there was any kind of crime. So when we talk about trauma-informed interviewing, oftentimes we're interacting with people who have, like I said, a lifetime or even generations of uh, trauma. And for a patrol officer to be able to sort through that in the moment can be arduous, right? It can be difficult. So one of the things that I wanna try to do now is I, have, I brought in Heather, who's a survivor. I'm gonna have her tell her story and I'm gonna actually interview her a little bit about her experience. First of all, I'm gonna try to do this to demonstrate a trauma-informed interview. Um, but also I wanna make sure that um, I'm trying to use these skills to make Heather feel safe to show her that I'm being transparent and trustworthy. Um, I wanna to try to collaborate with her and give her an opportunity to tell her story and be respectful to her. Uh, but I also make, need to make sure that, I, um, that she understands that I'm trying to create this safe environment, but she still has a choice. And, and what she shares about her story is gonna be up to her. So I'm gonna step back a little bit and I'm gonna start this as if uh, this is the first time that we're meeting. And then we're gonna go through a little bit and have her kind of tell her story. Uh, some of the things you may notice uh, if you kind of flip to the back of the last two pages, I'm sorry, the last page of your um, self-reflective journal, you'll notice here that this is the piece that you're gonna be filling in. You may wanna take some notes there as I talk. So, so first of all, uh, good morning, Heather. Um, as you know, my name is Andy McCurdy and I'm here today and we're talking about trauma-informed interviewing and procedural justice. Uh, so my job today is to try to facilitate um, this class. Uh, I'm hoping that you might be able to tell a story to the students today to help them understand a little bit about trauma and the impacts of people in positions of authority on trauma survivors. Uh, while we go through this, the, myself and the students may, may take some notes. Um, the notes are important to us because it's going to help us understand it. 
Uh, and then when we take those notes, we may ask, uh, as we go through it, we may ask you for some clarifications. Um, we may ask you to kind of um, correct any mistakes of understanding that we, we may have, um, but it's completely up to you how much information you share and, and where this goes. Uh, my goal today is to do very little talking and just give you an opportunity to, to share with us your experience. And we're hoping to use your experience as something that's gonna help guide us in, in the way we do our work. Um, so before we kind of jump into um, the main reason we're here today, um, I wanted to congratulate you on finishing your master's program. I'm, I'm sure that was a lot of work. Um, do you mind telling me a little bit about uh, what it means to get a master's in social work? Um, it means, I mean, the first thing means I'm not stupid. I've got DV abuser tapes that play in my head that I'm stupid. Women are stupid. So it's just, it's another level, another degree that says, wait, I'm not stupid. Um, and it means then I'll be able to help, um, better help other um, domestic violence survivors um, and other vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Um, so yeah, it's just like huge. And now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at different PhD programs already. So. Well, um, good on you for taking the time. How long did it take you to get your master's? Um, so in 2013, I, I went back, well, so in 1990 and 91, I attended Tacoma Community College. Um, one of my abusers showed up on campus, shot out the back of a truck window of one of my, one of my classmates. So I, I dropped out of college, like, and I didn't even do it the right way. I just never went back um, because of the trauma. Um, so when I went back to, um, uh, TCC in 2013, I really only had a GED. I mean, I had a few credits. Um, so it took from 2013 until just Saturday was our commencement with my MSW. So, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's, uh, it's, it's worth celebrating. So, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, okay. So as we go through this today, as I mentioned, um, I know you're going to talk about some things that may be difficult for you to talk about. Um, all I ask is that you do your best. Uh, I'm hoping that we can all learn a little bit from your, your story today. I do know from talking to you previously that um, some of your views, uh, some of your experiences with abuse actually involve law enforcement officers. And um, I'm hoping that we may be able to ask what may sound like some difficult questions to better understand that. And with the goal of being how do we create an environment where a survivor of trauma is able to share their story with us in the future outside of this type of a, a classroom setting. Um, so all I ask is that you uh, tell us your truth, that you share your story, and uh, that you be patient with us while we ask some follow-up questions to try to, to try to better understand it. So, um, and I understand that there, it's, this is not a story of one abuse. I know that there's been a series of uh, traumas and abuses, and um, it's up to you where you start. If you want to start with the most recent or the first or somewhere in the middle, um, uh, I'd just uh, love to hear your story and, and uh, kind of go from there. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with, um, well, trying to focus just on the last couple of weeks, spring quarter and preparing to graduate with my master's degree in social work, my MSW. Um, I actually became physically ill from spending days and hours thinking about um, the decades of trauma that I've experienced and that I actively avoid thinking about. However, speaking with Chief Andy McCurdy um, last week, um, I really had that sense of I feel safe and I trust him because he spent time genuinely building rapport, sharing his education and his fam family background, his beliefs, showing real empathy and truly listening and caring about my lived experiences. Um, in fact, a couple of days ago, I spoke with my DV advocate and I shared with her that I was still trying to wrap my head around my positive experience with a male law enforcement officer showing empathy because that's not what I have experienced during decades of domestic violence and trauma. After experiencing trauma at the hands of my perpetrators, 
I was often re-traumatized by law enforcement, family, friends, and others who did not and do not understand domestic violence, and they would ask questions that were not trauma-informed. They were always victim-blaming. What did I do to cause it? So I just hope that sharing today and being vulnerable will help at least one person benefit. Um, so I have vague memories. Um, beginning when I was about four or five, I was sexually abused by an adult male in Canada. Um, I was also sexually um, abused. I was probably 10 years old in Florida. And I did not tell my parents. And before today, I had never disclosed that to law enforcement as my earliest trauma experiences. Um, then when I was 14, it was during April 1985, I was a virgin and forcibly raped by Joe in Tacoma. His house was just off 6th Ave near a park. And I relived that assault every time I drive down 6th Ave or in that vicinity. I recall his father breaking into his room, breaking Joe's bat that Joe had used to jam the door. His father called my parents to pick me up. My parents told me they called the police and that nothing could be done, no consequences because he was 16 and I was 14. And because I went in his room, no consequences despite my verbally loudly crying, no, 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 stop. And I, and despite begging to be saved from Joe's painful, violent sexual assault, there were no consequences. Because apparently entering a room gave him permission to do what he did. Um, so since that assault, I've wondered why police officers who are usually male allow other males to sexually assault, abuse, and rape females. Was was the rape my fault because I trusted Joe and went into his room to talk? Trusting the door would remain open. Was the rape my fault because I didn't physically fight off a stronger, bigger person who pinned me down with all his strength? Why wasn't I taken to the hospital? Why do I not vividly recall speaking to police that night or the next day? Did my brain block out parts of the trauma and the the re-traumatization by police, all the victim blaming questions. I have learned during my higher education at UW Tacoma and during DV support groups that yes, my brain protects me from living every second of the trauma that I've experienced. Weeks later, Joe, Tony and Tim showed up at my locker at Curtis Junior High School as school adjourned. They didn't attend my school. I recall Tony and Tim were 18, they were adults. And Joe attended Wilson High School. I still don't remember how I managed to get safely to my dad's car for the ride home. I recall being terrified as those guys followed us home. I remember Tony attacked my mother and axed my mom's car. I recall the ax in the fender of the car because she was protecting me. The guys fled and after police were called. And then knowing the, the police were at my house because Tony had called me. Tony did return alone to face legal consequences. However, did he really face legal consequences? I still don't know. I remember being told by Tony and Joe and Noakes guys that Tony Carbone's family was part of a local mob. So I never reported any more abuse against those guys after that. When I was 15, I was sexually assaulted by so-called friends and adult men. I still remember once waking up at a friend's place near Tacoma General, not remembering falling asleep the night before and feeling as if I had been drugged. I woke up with my pants unzipped. I felt physically violated and I was too afraid to call the police because I was a runaway at the time. And the police didn't do anything about the first rape when I was 14. They would have asked why I was at a friend's house and not at home, more victim blaming. And then they probably would have locked me up at Raymond Hall for being a teen runaway instead of locking up a perpetrator. I remember self-harming numerous times with a really cool butterfly knife. 
and once contemplating suicide, thinking of cutting my wrist at the park that could be seen from my first rapist's house. I still have unpleasant dreams about certain areas of Tacoma where I was sexually assaulted and raped by adult men, so-called friends and strangers when I was 14, 15, 16, etc. And I didn't report any of those assaults because of intense fear, fear of retaliation, fear of police blaming me again for being raped. My head was busted open less than one month after turning 16, shortly after becoming pregnant by an older man. The perpetrator who busted my head open was my sister's abusive husband. My sister was only 16 and her much older husband had forced her to be an underage prostitute in downtown Tacoma during the mid eighties. She was also being physically abused. And I remember not understanding why she wouldn't leave or call the police for help. And yet I knew the police would blame her for staying because, I mean, even I had victim blaming thoughts. Had I been taught by society and law enforcement to think victims really are to blame? I remember Tim's mother drove me to St. Joe's Hospital and she threatened to harm me if I told about my very bloody, painful head injury. I still remember feeling scared, terrified, and her gripping my arm, telling the ER staff that I fell down the stairs. She tried to go with me to the ER room to ensure I wouldn't tell the truth about the violent assault. I remember feeling a sense of relief when she wasn't permitted in the room with me. I disclosed to the female nurses what actually happened. My sister's husband violently hit me on the top of my head with nunchucks. I still remember him lying to my sister, telling her that he threw a radio and the radio just happened to bounce off the wall and hit me. And she believed him because believing him was safer than accepting the truth. She needed to survive in that abusive relationship and marriage. I felt safer at the, after ER staff called my father. He took me to Madigan Air Force Base for treatment that consisted of carefully shaving part of my head and receiving two layers of stitches. I still have an indentation where the scar is located. I vaguely recall my father driving me to Pierce County Courthouse building to assist with the criminal case against him. And yet I do not recall how I was questioned. Again, my brain blocked aspects of the trauma. I do recall he took a plea deal. I was a runaway because my parents didn't protect me from all the men who abused, assaulted, and raped me. And since they wouldn't protect me, then why would I expect the police and law enforcement to protect me after assault? Instead of reporting Todd, who was 23 years old, for raping and impregnating me at my sister and her husband's house in Hilltop when I was 15, almost 16, my parents forced me to marry the adult rapist in, 19, in March 1987. My parents and a Pierce County judge allowed the marriage of a 23-year-old rapist and me, a 16-year-old pregnant rape victim, to occur in the Pierce County Courthouse. I still remember wearing pink sweats. Anytime I wear sweats, I remember, I remember all this. While pregnant, Todd attacked me and tried breaking my hand by squeezing my hand really hard. I fled to the YWCA Pierce County shelter on Broadway and received help and emotional support. I was able to secure TANF in my first solo apartment before moving back home because I was only 16 pregnant and scared to be alone in an apartment that was not too far from Todd's apartment. After my first daughter was born, when I was 17, 18, 19, I was sexually assaulted and abused again by several men, strangers, friends, boyfriends, and I didn't report any of it. I thought, why, what's the point? I had learned that males can do whatever they want to females without fear of consequences from law enforcement and that there's no help. When I was 20 in 1991, I was raped by a coworker who I thought was a friend. This happened in Tacoma, a block or two off 6th Ave. Jeff walked out of a room and blew smoke in my face, which paralyzed me. I didn't call the police because I already painfully learned since I was 14 that the police who had always been older white men did not do anything to help rape and sexual assault victims like myself. So I quit working at Texaco on 6th Ave. And so Jeff began stalking me, constantly driving by in my apartment near the Tacoma Mall, 
calling hundreds of times per day. This is before caller ID, but I knew it was him. Slashed my car tires on multiple occasions, threw stuff at my bedroom window. I was granted a protection order, which the police seemed to not care about or enforce because whenever I called 911 to report the constant violations, they didn't care. I don't even recall police ever being sent or showing up when I called for help. I ended up fleeing to Utah for a couple years because of it. Around this same time before going to Utah, my then three-year-old daughter was sexually assaulted by her uncle Brian. And again, I was too afraid to report the assault that Brian had admitted to that day because I figured the police wouldn't care and they wouldn't show up. And if police showed up, Brian would lie to the police despite Brian admitting the sexual abuse to me and his brother, Roland, who was also abusing me and my daughter. And Roland told me if I called the police on Brian, his mother would have a heart attack and die. And I didn't wanna feel like I killed somebody by reporting a sexual assault on my daughter. I felt stuck, no help, no protection. I couldn't protect my daughter. Police would have asked, why did you let Brian watch your little girl while you walked to and from Stadium Thriftway with Roland? I would have been blamed by the police, not the pedophile that before that moment, I didn't know was and is a pedophile. I had trusted him and that trust would have used, would have been used to blame me for the sexual abuse of my daughter. Very, very recently, just a few weeks ago, after all these years, Brian approached my best friend of 30 plus years who owns a used beater car lot and Brian mentions my name. When my best friend told me, I was immediately triggered and terrified. And so was my daughter when I told her. She still remembers what he did to her when she was three. And again, when she was approximately seven to eight years old after we returned to Washington after leaving Utah. She and I don't feel safe and no law enforcement hasn't helped us and won't help protect us. It's always gonna be our fault. We'll always be blamed, victim blaming questions. Thankfully, she lives in a different state. In approximately 1996, after nearly nine years of trying to leave Roland, I finally took my daughter and left and ended up in another DV relationship and brief marriage to Scott, who was extremely physically abusive. I always had bruises on my arms, which his salon clients would see. He bashed my head into the wall more than once, dragged me through the apartment numerous times, beat me while I slept multiple times. His clients, including a five police officer, would see the bruises and would tell me that Scott would stop hurting me if I stopped trying to escape. Again, it was my fault. I contemplated suicide and yet didn't want to die. I wanted to escape. I finally sought a restraining order and called the police. I still vividly remember where I was standing in my mother's house, painted green near Fred Myers off of 72nd. And I was speaking to two male police officers about what happened. I recall they'd listened. And yet they failed to ask me about all the abuse I experienced at the hands of Scott. They only wanted to know what had happened that day. I wondered if I was to blame for the abuse because I had tried to escape and walk away during his controlling fits of rage. And yet I returned to my abusive husband because despite being extremely violent, he could be really affectionate and loving. Now, decades later, I know that is the cycle of abuse. Despite reconciling, the prosecutor was adamant that I testify against Scott because he had slipped through the criminal justice system on other assaults before I met Scott. I recall the defense attorney victim blaming me and implying I was a bad mother because I brought my daughter to the salon where Scott worked as an independent contractor, hairstylist, and I was his receptionist. Scott forced my daughter and I to be at the salon with him all the time as part of his controlling abuse of domestic violence. And Scott was acquitted because there was doubt because I had returned to him before the trial began. Again, I felt and believed the justice system failed me. Again, I learned that it's best to not seek help. After reconciling, Scott abused my daughter and she called 911. 
The police showed up and said that physically disciplining a child is not a crime. And soon after my daughter and I escaped the violent and unpredictable abuse. I met the next abusive man while seeking a divorce from the previous abuser. Ron was very pushy and aggressive. And it was this seven year relationship and marriage that began in Kent, it was in King County, it was Kent, Washington, Tacoma, Washington. When I learned about and experienced every type of abuse, gaslighting, cyber stalking, being raped while sleeping and told that it's not rape or assault because I was his wife, as if he owned me like property. He threatened to murder me, murder suicide as he cleaned his gun a few days after the first time I had escaped with my little boy and older daughter. Ron's an ex-police officer who had also been military police and a private investigator within the decade before I met him. He was, still is, extremely charming and chameleon-like and extremely cunning, manipulative, vindictive, and dangerous. He knows the police. So whenever I called the police for help to protect me from the violence and death threats, to protect my children, Ron would use his charm and police background to become a great guy while telling the police that I was crazy and suicidal. I was neither crazy nor suicidal during this relationship and marriage. I was terrified of being murdered. I was terrified he would murder my children. I needed to escape the abuse. He was never removed from the house and never arrested for the assaults, rapes, abuse. Police never offered DV resources or shelter info. Ron also abused my older daughter in numerous ways, and then he would call the police against her within seconds before she would call for help. My boss at the time witnessed some of the abuse and saw bruises and was my main support person for me when we lived in Oregon. She advised me to watch the movie Gaslighting so that I would understand what was happening to me. I started seeing therapists to cope with and learn about abuse and domestic violence. Ron showed up at one of my sessions and threatened the therapist, who then said she would not be my therapist anymore if I stayed in that abusive, dangerous marriage. Another therapist warned me to escape as soon as possible because Ron had numerous guns and had threatened to kill me, which she had learned through the anger management therapist in the same office. He also physically, psychologically, and sexually abused my older son, who is officially diagnosed on the autism spectrum. I learned in 2011 at the YWCA Pierce County that characteristics and symptoms of autism, Asperger's syndrome, are the same as children who witness and experience abuse, domestic violence, and trauma in the home. CPS was called numerous times by mandatory reporters and we received no help because no bones were broken. And other times they went to the previous address and closed the case. I was finally granted a temporary protection order known as a FAPA in Oregon. Ron had been putting all of our money into an account with only his name and then hired the best scariest lawyer in town. Well, I had an inexperienced pro bono attorney with morals. And after multiple attempts to flee and seek a divorce, the third divorce motion was finalized in 2006. I was finally able to successfully protect my son, Ryan, in it was either 2009, 2010. And that was after my son was in a six week inpatient treatment center in Oregon. Ryan has PTSD from the abuse, severe fear of male police officers, and he still has nightmares of his father. I also have PTSD, severe fear of male police officers, and I still have nightmares consisting of him breaking into my home, saying it's his home, refusing to leave, assaulting me. And then when I call the police in my dream, the nightmare, the phone is broken, no one answers 911, and no one saves me. And the most recent violent nightmare was on Friday night. I woke up panicked, sweating, heart racing, terrified because my brain still thinks the vivid nightmares are real. In 2011, a psychiatrist prescribed new prescriptions for my son who was diagnosed, as I said, with, well, then it was Asperger's, now it's autism spectrum. He was also diagnosed with ADHD. 
Rai had horrible side effects that caused uncontrollable agitation and outbursts. One time I was driving on 6th Ave in Tacoma. This would have been in, yeah, 2011. And Rai lost control inside the car. So reluctantly, I pulled into the parking lot of Raymond Hall because that was the closest parking lot. I called 911 for medical assistance. Several police officers arrived instead of medical professionals. I explained Ryan's diagnosis and medical crisis. And instead of ensuring my little boy received medical assistance, an aggressive white privileged male officer harmed my child, forcefully handcuffing him and pushed him to the ground. And the officer proceeded to tell me that if I would do my job as a parent and physically disciplined, also known as beating my child, because that's the terminology that Ron would use and what he would do, then he wouldn't have to do my job for me. My son also suffered horrific physical abuse by his ex-police father while telling me I couldn't protect Rye and knowing I couldn't protect Rye from his father's abuse and beatings. The officer had unnecessarily physically assaulted my mentally ill young child during a medical mental health crisis reminded me 100% of my scary abusive ex who is an ex-cop and most likely a psychopath without any ounce of empathy. I still regret calling 911 that day. I blame myself for my son being hurt that day because if I had not called 911 for medical assistance, my child would not have been harmed. My call for medical assistance definitely caused my boy, my little boy to be physically assaulted and solidified his and my fear of law enforcement. I was subjected to reliving my son being physically abused while blaming me for the abuse and trauma caused by a heartless police officer that day. During the past three decades, I learned through my experiences and society news stories, majority of law enforcement won't pursue his, she said, cases. And more recently, I learned wealthy abusers, rapists can buy their way out of justice and accountability while blaming me for all of it. So going back to the reason my children and I moved to Washington from Oregon in 2011 was in 2008, I was sexually assaulted and impregnated by my then dental hygienist who was 22 years older than I am. I endured abuse, sexual assault, rapes, stalking, prior to getting knocked up, reproductive abuse and then additional sexual assaults raped occurred during parenting time visits, which resulted in a second pregnancy birth. Police questioned me why I didn't report him to the police. They asked me how I allowed myself to get raped more than once and pregnant a second time. After I finally reported all the trauma, even the older white male DA asked me why I didn't fight back or physically stop Dennis from ma raping me. I thought, why? So I can be arrested for fighting back? I've seen other DV victims be arrested for fighting back during sexual and physical assaults. I thought, why? So that he will beat me while raping me? And why? So I can risk my precious children getting physically harmed while they laid next to me during the sexual assault? He even ejaculated his semen on my baby girl's hair. He constantly threatened to take away our baby girl if I reported the abuse, assaults, death threats, rapes. He threatened to have me killed the way an NFL football player hired someone to murder a pregnant girlfriend. And I found the news article he was referring to, which confirmed to me that he was serious. And yet people thought he was a great guy. He would remind me that he is wealthy has a million dollar house, knows people, has connections, including a scary powerful trial attorney in Oregon, Eugene, Oregon. I was afraid knowing I was a single mom scraping by to pay all the bills, knowing I couldn't protect my babies from his, him and his power. He continued to sexually assault me, always waiting for me to fall asleep to do so during parenting time visits. I had a court order that said that he had to come into my home for parenting time visits. And that's how he will continue to rape me. 
And yet it was my fault. Like why, why let him in? Because a court and a judge said I had to. He would say that he couldn't stop himself from sexually assaulting me when I was sleeping because he loved me. He raped me numerous times with our two young children lying next to me on my bed. I had started documenting the abuse and assault in my calendar and my little girl who was an early talker began disclosing abuse to DV advocates and child care providers and disclosed possible inappropriate touching by her father. She was disclosing abuse towards her by him or she may have just been disclosing the sexual assault she witnessed and I experienced by her father. My older son was also physically abused and threatened by Dennis. I finally asked an attorney for advice and then followed her advice. A female CPS investigator and female sheriff deputy responded to my CPS inquiry. They were caring and exhibited compassion. They listened and they understood saying they could personally relate because they experienced something similar. The deputy captured photos of the bruises on my leg that I hadn't even noticed. Bruises that were caused by Dennis when he attempted to spread my legs to rape me again. I was overwhelmed by fear and emotionally exhibiting fight or flight for safety and unable to even focus on the bruises that were in the here and now. CPS ordered me to protect my children from Dennis or I would lose my children. After a thorough investigation, the female deputy advised me she would be arresting Dennis for the assault and abuse. And yet within a few hours of his arrest, Dennis's powerful trial attorney paid $60,000 cash bail and contacted their connections within Lynn County CPS and DA's office. Which I learned because the female deputy called me to give me a heads up. She cared. A police officer finally cared. And yet the CPS couldn't afford an appeal. So the CPS investigator closed the case and was unable and, and put it as unable to determine so that he couldn't uh, appeal it, despite knowing the abuse in DV had happened and would continue happening. My attorney and I met with the male DA, who stated Dennis has money and the budget cut country or county couldn't afford a he said she said trial and the children were too young to be witnesses children should never have to witness something or testify to that despite my attorney's plea to at least educate a jury on domestic and intimate partner and interpersonal violence and the power imbalance of an older wealthy white male predator who was a dental provider preying on a younger dental patient and yet I was not his only victim, just the only brave or stupid enough to report his abuse and assaults to law enforcement and the Oregon, Oregon Dental Board at the time, which is public knowledge and accessible online. And I'm listed as patient HS. I continued to be financially and psychologically abused by him. I was unable to pay for adequate legal support or expert witnesses to fight for my children years ago. They took them away when Jason was two, almost three. Maddie was four. The legal and justice systems failed and continue failing to protect my children. And I can't protect them. They're now 11 and 12 and they continue to experience and disclose abuse. And I still cannot protect them. Maddie disclosed to me that she cannot trust adults or authority figures. So she confides only in her friends. I am reminded again and again that seeking assistance from law enforcement doesn't help. Despite finally receiving care, compassion, and understanding from the female CPS investigator and female sheriff deputy, I was reminded and learned a patriarchal male controlled system protects its own. However, I know not all males in these broken systems are like the males I have experienced. And I know many more males in law enforcement and judicial systems want to learn how to be and do better when interacting, interviewing, and assisting trauma victim survivors. Skipping forward to my last return to Washington in 2013, after my precious angels were taken away, I focused on attending DV support groups, mental health therapy, 
and I pursued a higher education. I learned that abusive guys notice and pursue me because they see that I am a giver, full of empathy, caring, and I'm quiet and passive. I also learned about red flags and green flags while attending DV support groups during the past 10 years at CARDVA and Women's Space in Oregon and Don and YWCA Pierce in South King County in Washington. I've also learned to remove myself from abuse and relationships faster. The higher education I received since 2013, going from a GED to a MSW also confirmed all the isms and lack of justice I experienced because it's embedded in a broken patriarchal legal justice system that needs to be fixed, that needs to be reformed. Before graduating with my BA in psychology and global engagement in 2016, I was briefly married to an abusive, undocumented immigrant in South King County. I was too afraid to call 911 after days of being abused and threatened. He had threatened to slit my throat multiple times. He is 6'3 and I am maybe 5'4. He also intimidated and threatened to harm my autistic son. My UW Tacoma Islam course professor called 911 on my behalf after I mentioned to her being too afraid to call for help. When officers arrived, I was too terrified to open the door because Mbay threatened to harm me if I opened the door. He had placed a long knife on the kitchen counter while threatening me. I eventually ran to, the op to open the door because Mbay was quickly aggressively approaching my son, accusing Rai of calling the police on him. The deputies weren't really listening to me or understanding the escalating violent behavior and threats of harm by Mbe. And I was told that since Mbe wasn't holding the knife when they arrived, that Mbe was not in trouble. Then the deputies suggested I seek a DVPO and suggested my son and I leave our apartment and let Mbe, who is the perpetrator, have our apartment and my son's two cats, because Mbe is an undocumented immigrant, despite Mbe being the aggressor and perpetrator. I was terrified and respectfully declined the deputy's suggestion. So Mbe was finally escorted out of the apartment. I was granted a temporary DVPO, which was never served on Mbe because he quickly flew to New York, back to Seattle, and then he flew to an undisclosed location closer to the East Coast, and then he walked across the US-Canada border in the middle of the night. I did not pursue a permanent DVPO because Mbe fled from ICE to Canada in April of 2017, and I cooperated with ICE officers when they wanted to search my apartment for him before sunrise days after he fled. I relayed any relevant information to ICE officers who never once victim blamed me. They listened, cared and understood. After that brief marriage and annulment, I was abused and assault and raped by a so-called friend while I was being nice, trying to be helpful, always forgiving, putting myself in a situation to be harmed. I'm so used to now victim blaming myself because of all the decades of victim blaming questions by law enforcement. I filed a motion for a DVPO, which was granted for five years until 2023. Even the DVPO process consists of victim blaming and perpetrators attempting to manipulate judges, commissioners, and law enforcement. I also reported the physical and sexual assaults abuse to the Kent police. A male officer tried his best to listen and care, and yet judgmental eye rolls and victim blaming questions started. So I was done talking. Why ask the victim questions that imply the DV abuse, assaults, and rapes are their fault? Why victimize the traumatized victim during interviews and trials? Why not hold the perpetrator accountable and ask the perpetrator questions? Why are perpetrators not traumatized and victimized during investigative interviews and criminal trials? Why does law enforcement protect DV perpetrators and their rights above and instead of victim survivors? These are all the questions that pop in my head while I'm being asked questions that are definitely not trauma informed. The 2018 case was closed at my request after I provided police with documentation and then spoke with my DV advocate. I had been reminded how I would be somehow blamed for not fighting back or questioned about not going to the hospital immediately afterwards. 
I would be subjected to more victim blaming. I requested to close the case because I did not want to be psychologically abused, violated, and re-victimized again by the broken legal justice system, which I told the female detective who began victim blaming me. After closing the sexual assault rape case, a wall had violated the DVPO numerous times. I reported all the violations and provided Auburn police with copies of text messages and missed calls. Officers who responded to my calls took photos of the text, missed calls on my phone. And yet the Auburn city prosecutor, who is a white male, declined to pursue charges because apparently phone evidence isn't good enough for prosecution and would waste city of Auburn funding. I was also told law enforcement would need to catch the perpetrator in person at my home. Again, I felt like law enforcement and the justice legal systems didn't care about me or other DV and sexual assault victim survivors. And that perpetrators are provided more protections and rights than victims. A few months ago, while driving past Pickwick and Auburn, I noticed a wall driving the car that was behind me. I was terrified and experienced a full body PTS trigger, sweating, heart racing, deafening flight or fight or flight. He passed by my car as I quickly turned right off Auburn Way into Starbucks. I messaged my son. I texted my Don GV advocate what happened. I did not contact law enforcement because during the past 36 years, including recently, ever since the first time I was raped, I have been reminded that contacting law enforcement will not help me or my children in contacting law enforcement or other protection agencies can actually harm my children and me. Last week, I watched the last episode, the final episode this, of uh, a million little things, which included a sexual assault storyline. The 18 year old female victim finally mustered up the courage to report a sexual assault. And the older white male detective who is judgmental implied she encouraged the twice her age male teacher to assault her. And last month, as part of an interpersonal violence master social work course, Dr. AB suggested everyone watch Unbelievable on Netflix, which is based on true stories. I didn't know what the movie was about. However, I figured it must be about interpersonal violence. I was completely triggered by the older, heartless white male officers in episode one. And I found myself not surprised to find out these were Washington King County officers and detectives. I was so angry and heartbroken. Even knowing this is just a show, but it's based on a true story, witnessing these older, heartless, privileged white male officers and detectives question the young sexual assault victim over and over and over psychologically abusing and gaslighting her and then not believing her, calling her a liar and eventually charging and convicting her with making a false statement, despite her telling the truth about the sexual assault. I kept thinking if only they were trauma informed. I continued to binge watch the remaining episodes because there was no way I could fall asleep after watching that, that first episode. I kept hoping the young victim would finally receive justice. The, most of the other episodes focused on white female Colorado officers who were doing interactions and interviewing as sexual assault victims. And I noticed it was the opposite of the Washington law enforcement detectives. These female detectives utilized a trauma-informed lens and believed the victims, even when crime scenes were meticulously clean, leaving little to no evidence behind. After seeing that, I just really recommend everybody watch Unbelievable to see that difference between trauma-informed and traumatizing victim-blaming interactions and interviewing. I just hope that, I just hope that you commit to learning and implementing trauma-informed victim interviewing and care and do no harm, especially towards vulnerable victims who have already been harmed, victimized and traumatized. Thank you for listening. Heather, I had a, a couple of follow-up questions I wanted to ask, but I wanted to offer you a break first. That was a lot to, to go through. 
um, where I think the students are also due for a break. Do you want to, yeah. do you want to push through or do you want to take a break and come back in about 10 minutes and, and carry on from there? It's up to you. A break's good. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate you uh, pushing through that. And uh, for everyone, it's um, 11 o'clock right now. Uh, if everybody could uh, mute their, uh, I'm going to mute my video and everything. We'll be back at 1110.